I come to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Years ago, when Diane and I were referred to as dinks, dual income, no kids, we lived in the city of Lancaster. About three blocks from our home, there was a really great restaurant. The food was good, the wine list was nationally recognized, and the service was leisurely. We enjoyed the measured pace of service because as newlyweds, we were quite happy to sit and stare into each other's eyes. A two-hour dinner was a pleasant indulgence. And to complete the atmosphere, the owner of the restaurant would often come by the table and chat and ask about your meal and ask about your wine selection. Naturally, we liked this place so much we wanted to tell our friends about it. Well, one of my managers at work had a significant personal wine collection and his wife had more cookbooks than I have theology books. So it seemed only natural that they would love this place. On the Monday following their planned dinner, I expected to hear glowing reviews. But I only got a polite good morning. It was not until later in the week that Dave admitted they had a lousy time. They didn't feel safe parking in that part of town. Yes, three blocks from our house. <laughs> and while the food and wine were good, the service was slow. They needed to be home to relieve the babysitter. And they couldn't understand why the owner would interrupt them for a chat. They had a miserable time. And I've been hesitant to recommend restaurants ever since. It's understandable. We don't like to feel uncomfortable. So we avoid that potential. At least that's my justification. So as to avoid other uncomfortable feelings, I suspect that most here would prefer that, I had, that Ernest had stopped reading the gospel at verse 10. In the beginning section, we have a really nice parable about filling the halls of a wedding banquet. This is, of course, common language to describe the coming of the kingdom of God and the Messiah. It's not unusual to think of this as universal salvation, welcoming all, both the good and the bad. And while God's salvation is available to all, God calls us to a life transformed. How we respond to the grace of our Lord does matter. It's our choice to follow God. And following verse 10, we come to the section on judgment, complete with weeping and gnashing of teeth. That certainly puts a damper on a good story, doesn't it? This is clearly one of those stories that can make us feel uncomfortable, so we'd probably prefer to avoid it. But if we live a godly life, ours is not to worry. The grace, love, and fellowship of our Lord will be upon us. But what about those who are not in the church or living a godly life? I was recently reminded of what may be Archbishop William Temple's most famous quote, or perhaps the only quote people know of his. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. I suspect that Archbishop Temple was addressing two different areas of concern. First, he was most assuredly concerned with society and caring for the least of these, as Jesus calls us to do. But I suspect that he was also reminding us to call those 
who are not yet members to become disciples of Christ. Temple didn't use the E word, evangelism, but it's implicit in today's gospel and I think also within his famous quote. In the parable, the king sent his servants out into the streets to invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The wedding hall was filled with guests. Now for the unworthy, notably the Pharisees and the chief priests, judgment was forthcoming. So, what would be more fun to talk about? Judgment or evangelism? <laughs> or option three, right? Well, let's leave the judgment to God. It's not ours to judge. But it is our duty to go into the streets and invite everyone to the banquet. Episcopalians really don't like the E word. It's a bit ironic, since Episcopal and evangelism both share the same first letter. But our history has kept us away from the need to evangelize. In the good old days, the state mandated attendance at the local parish, and financial support came through taxes. If we'd not had that little disagreement with King George, we might still be the official state religion. But let's consider that there is more strength in belief that is found through choosing faith over having it mandated by law. Let's also remember how Jesus gathered his disciples. He called them and they chose to follow. Jesus never forced anyone to follow him. He told his story and invited them. It was their choice whether to follow or not. A year ago, this parish gave me the gift of an icon of St. Andrew. Well, St. Andrew was the first disciple called by Jesus. When I look at that icon, I try to remember that he didn't hesitate and followed immediately. And Andrew's first act as a disciple was an act of evangelism. He went to his brother Simon Peter and said, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Peter to meet Jesus. Well, if Jesus had taken any sales training classes that are offered today, he would have been cast out of the class as a failure. Jesus never went for the clothes like a good salesman. You have to ask for the business, we're taught. Instead, he told his story and allowed people to follow him if they chose to do so. That is evangelism. Offer the good news and allow the Holy Spirit to work. Just like recommending a good restaurant, tell the story and know that you can't make someone enjoy their meal. I'm sure that my friend and his wife found other restaurants at which to dine. They just didn't get the benefit of what we thought was the best place in town. And yes, St. Francis is credited with saying, preach the gospel always. Use words when necessary. Preach the gospel with your actions, but don't hesitate to use words to talk about God in your life. Our job is to tell our story and how Jesus is part of that story. And looking around, I can see that there are many compelling stories to be told. Each of us has a compelling story about how Jesus has affected our lives. It may be deep inside just waiting to find the light of day. If you don't believe me, ask someone to hear your story over coffee. 
and then ask to hear their story. Once you've done that, then go out and tell the world. There are so many horrific events in the news today. Wouldn't it be nice to hear the good news? I heard a holy story this past week that brought tears to my eyes, and it affirmed that the Holy Spirit is working here at Hickory Neck. Tell your story and let the Holy Spirit work. The person you talk with may come here to worship, they may go somewhere else, or it may not be the time for them. Just tell your story and let them choose. If we all tell our story, we will fill the wedding hall. <laughs>